Okay, so this is being recorded, uh, like I mentioned, and so I'm just going to make a run at this for the next 50 minutes without questions, if that be okay. Um, we'll wrap it up with a song, and then we'll have an opportunity to uh, talk if you have some questions. But I'm just going to run with this and see what I can do to mess you up. Okay, I will take little bits of paragraphs and you'll get these if you sign up back there. Um, I'll, send, I'll ship it to you as a document so you have these notes. <clears throat> so I'm just going to work each word and then talk a little bit about it. So what informs me becomes me, thoughts on the nature of suffering. I mean the me in there, not some idea of what you should be, but the me in here is who we're talking about. So the first quote comes from a book, The Lament of the Dead, which is uh, thoughts on Carl Jung's red book by James Hillman and the man who edited Carl Jung's Red Book. I almost brought the volume. The reason it's important is here is a man who had the courage to be in the experience of a descent into his own madness and survive the journey and write and talk about it. Madness simply meaning that he understood he had reached the end of his rope of what he thought he knew about himself successful psychiatrist in, in Zurich, in, in Switzerland, successful father. It was 1913, he had a huge dream. He realized that he had succeeded in the world and lost his soul in the process. So what happened and what is this thing called soul? The quote is, his concepts, Jung's, were of utility to others and that was part of his, you could say, physician's task, to provide something for others that would give them orientation when they faced the dark nights in their own underworlds. That's why we're here tonight. I've sat in that consulting room on Main Street now since 88, and have listened to so many stories of people's journey into the underworld and their return. And our talks here are to share what we've learned from that adventure. As a person said when she left the other day, more simply said, the deeper I go, the lighter I feel. As another gentleman said, Lightness of being is priceless. The paradox is you have to go deep to be light. We're going to talk about that now. This summer, late summer, September, Susan and I were on the Oregon coast in our trailer, which we love, driving the trailer around, camping. It was uh, 95 degrees inland very hot for Oregon. So there was this huge force 500 meters off the coast, the fog bank, the raging wind. Susan was all bundled up in multiple layers and hat, sitting behind a rock. I was in my swim shorts and jumping in the Pacific. <laughs> but on the way back, the, the wind was blowing so hard, it stung me. It was like I was getting sandblasted. So I regrouped, we laughed, took a picture. <clears throat> and this is what came to me in that moment. I've come to see how I am not that which is happening to me. A force within me has bonded to nature's independent reality, one that is free from my life story and yet wholly interactive with it. Boom. Okay, we know that there is this paradox that each of us has to find a way to relate to. 
the paradox of life. Those of you who have been in my practice have heard me talk about Jung's statement that the, <clears throat> the maturity is the capacity to bear the tension of irreconcilable paradox. What informs me becomes me is a challenge to hold that paradox in a way that I'd like to inform you about tonight. So nature's independent reality, what's going on all around us, this is so fun, isn't it? <laughs> Look at all you out there, I should talk like this. <laughs> that would be funny. Uh, <clears throat> So let's talk about reality just for a moment because it's, it's quite the concept and it's all made up. I mean, I'm, we're actually, we're all made up. But we're here and it's real. Sure. The word reality entered the English language in the 16th century. How was our daily experience conceptualized before a word was assigned to what we now so steadfastly maintain as real? Is it a coincidence that the stirrings of the Industrial Revolution as well as the dawn of reason, Kant's I think, therefore I am, coincided with the coining of the term reality? A constructed belief in reality separates us from reality. If what is meant by reality is the processing, like you're doing right now, of stimuli by the brain, and the subsequent sorting of said stimuli into clear, comprehensible patterns that inform our choices of behavior or attitude. If that's what we mean by reality, then we have this dilemma. The brain believes a reality that is separate from this reality, that's a paradox and a conflict. So our default setting is that we believe, what we believe informs us. And this is, I'm going to keep whittling down into 10 points about what we pay attention to, what informs us. This is the background. I'm setting the stage here, okay? Stick with me. This is dense, and it'll take a while to sit with you. That's why we have recordings. That's why we have notes. Don't be afraid. Stick with me. I'm just setting the stage. So, our default setting is that what we believe informs us. Yet beliefs act as a screen, allowing only that which does not disturb our preset arrangements. Now we start to get into the suffering piece here. This censorship leads to what we might call maladaptive normality. That's how we have to say normal anymore in my presence. <laughs> you mean maladaptive normality? Whatever you got going as normal that you think everybody else is, I can guarantee is maladaptive. You've made a bargain with it, and good on you. I mean, we have to function, but it's maladaptive. So what you allow to inform you becomes a smaller and smaller story. Because you've already made agreement that you know what's going on. And Maddie told us that's, forget it. <clears throat> Where we interpret what we know as representative of what is, another definition of maladaptive reality, our brain was, messes with our mind, setting up the conflict that keeps information distorted. Great little cartoon in the Daily Comical, Fraz or Fraz, or as the janitor character in the comic strip Fraz said the other day, the human brain craves reason in the absence of rationality. 
That's a problem. That keeps you busy. It keeps you anxious. It keeps you convinced. It keeps you defensive. It keeps me, excuse me, pronouns, 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 me. This is about my struggle that I think we share. <clears throat> okay, three more kind of set up quotes. So as Adam Gopnik addressed this puzzle of brain and mind in The New Yorker, he wrote, the really curious thing about minds and brains is that the truth about them lies not somewhere in the middle, but simultaneously on both extremes. This gets a little weird. As Montague wrote, we are always double in ourselves. If I understand me to be the complex system of self-awareness that over my lifetime adjusts itself with thoughts affecting the brain, as does in turn brain activity affect the moods, which are emotional thoughts, I have, then as Gopnik continues, we learn and shape our neurology as much as we inherit it. Here's the stinger right here. Our cells shape our brains at least as much as our brains ourselves. The edgy truth about being human is that we are seduced by what we experience, be that internally generated or externally generated. And who doesn't want to be impressed by our own senses, to be sensational? It's very seductive. The problem is, though, that it's both exhausting to seek and believe our own experience when it's all contrived anyway. So you're believing what you made up as a part of how you adapted, maladaptively, to your experiences in your persona, in your socialization process. You bought the goods, you adapt to that, and you think that's good information. <clears throat> we generate an ever-diminishing circle of what we allow to inform us. Hence the suffering. Finishing with this thought, he cites the popularity of Star Trek. Mr. Spock stands for the rational, analytic self who assumes that the mind is a mechanism and that everything it does is logical. Captain Kirk for the belief that what governs our life is not only irrational, but inexplicable, and the better for being so. Now it gets interesting. What do we allow to inform us? That's the question for the evening. What does it mean to be informed, and don't we all want to be well informed? Okay, here I go off, just for a bit, just two paragraphs. Light makes form possible. Think about it. Light makes form possible. Otherwise, it's the dark, formless void. Without light, there is no visible form. I mean the absence of light like cave dark, not midnight dark. Full moon eve, totally random when we set up this time. That's lovely. Full moon rising. Yep. It's one, one, four, one, four. That's interesting information to me. As Susan says, that's a full house, three ones and two fours. <laughs> Full house, full moon, that's information. I'm a little different since I know that. So, <laughs> if light informs, reveals form, then on what and how we shed light is the crucial question. What do you turn your light on? And by light, in this context, means seeing into the heart of something 
having enough light in our eyes to illuminate fresh forms. Insight is contrasted to, as Coolridge said, the madness of first impressions. watching PBS the other night. Thank you, gods, for PBS. And they had this program on alien planets. <clears throat> right up my alley. And the universe is filled with molecules. Why doesn't life take all the different forms? And they said this one thing, and I was jotting it down, because there are only certain information-containing molecules. Not every molecule, molecule is information containing. That's what triggers this thing we're living through right now. I found that fascinating. I really want to be an information containing molecule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. <clears throat> so, I'm going to have, share 10 ways of being informed. Then we'll wrap her up. So there's three sources of information. Internally generated, externally received, and then I've said comprehensively experienced. Let's say the mega caldera blows here in a couple of minutes. That'd be comprehensive information. A tsunami would be comprehensive information. The Great Recession, comprehensive information. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or who you are. Well, it does matter. We won't go into that <laughs> because we're all poor and then there's rich. But that's another story. So internally generated, externally received, and comprehensively experienced ways of getting information. So here are 10 different angles on that. Number one, accepting of others' projections of me as informative about me instead of about them. Okay. Accepting of others' projections onto me or of me as informative about me rather than being informative about them. How often do we receive other people's projections as information about ourselves? Oh, you're not coordinated. Oh, you're silly. Oh, you're stupid. Oh, you don't know what you're doing. Oh, you should be thinner. Oh, you should be stronger. Oh, you are my problem. Projection is an unconscious function that delivers information as a way of informing yourself about you. I'm going to try to do my best to stay away from bad information and good information, but that's bad information. <laughs> <laughs> to accept others' projections as a statement about myself. Now, if somebody gives me some information and it hits me hard and it, it resonates, I'm not talking about that. That's good stuff. But projection, where I become the screen for your material and interpret that as something to do with me, is the cause of great mental suffering. It's called love. <laughs> if you want the four-letter word. My projection onto you, I love you, I, you are this to me, you are everything, you are, that's called projection. It might well be true down the road. Projection. <clears throat> the second one, believing in a closed system as informative. Memories, obsessions, convictions would be examples of information from a closed system. Memories, obsessions, and convictions. 
I do love the word convictions because it has the root convict. <laughs> it somehow works. <laughs> I'm held prisoner to my convictions. No matter how well they're formed and how well you know them, that's one form of information. The third one, defending a position as a way of being informed. <clears throat> this is what the persona does. It defends a position as a way of being informed. I filled my form with a position that I'm defending this persona that I believe is who I am. So when two people defend their position in my office, all hell breaks loose. It, it's, it's really hard. I sweat a lot when that goes on. I don't like it, but it's important to keep at it because that's where the projection story really is experienced. If you didn't, if you weren't, if you, it's like, all oh, that's true. I drink too much. We don't have enough sex. I hate your mother. But if you're defending this position as a way of being informed, where are we going to go? We're going to polarize. And remember what was said by Gopnik that we are simultaneously on both ends of that. But if you stay at either end, you use up your information defending a position. And that's really unfulfilling. Next. <clears throat> Zealousness, be it one of the rational, irrational, scientific, scientific, mystical, or religious. That form of information. Zealousness. I'm passionate about this, obviously. What's the difference between passion and zealous? Dumb? Dogma. Dogma. Yep. I read an interesting quote the other day about authority. Maybe it was in The Lament of the Dead. I've always had trouble with authority. I've had authority issues. But I never quite understood what that meant. Dogma, zealousness, that form of information is a preset agreement as to what is true. Authority is a preset condition about what is true. It doesn't develop in the experience between the two people informing the situation. It's a conviction of a preset condition. That's what authority means. And that really sunk in. Because it's, I have a, a, a brother-in-law, God bless him, a doctor, Miles City, who has a great deal of authority, and I could never find a way to relate to it because it's always preset. It's always known. It's always scientific. It's always, there's no room for information other than what's already preset. And we each have those zones in our own psyche those preset authority positions that we believe as true. No, not as true. We believe are true. I'm going to get to as true here in a second. <clears throat> Believing what I think is true and right rather than as if true or inconclusive. As a woman said in my practice the other day, everything I know holds me back. Yet everything I know is my security. Our
our suffering has to do with the amount of energy we expend on protecting and defending a small story. That form of information had a place, but once information sets and turns into a belief, it becomes a sensor for what's allowed in. And once that censorship is established, we understand that as a way of maintaining our place in this madness and this beauty and this crazy wildness of life, right. But that form of information keeps us small. And the mission is to continue, my mission is to continue to look for examples of and experience character. And I'm going to get to that form of information in a minute. A couple more. Another form of information, so gripped by mood dysregulation that there is no other perspective possible or available. The cliche, the drama king or queen. Mood dysregulation as a form of information. It's one path of information. It is tyrannical. It is overwhelming. And it is panicky. But mood dysregulation is a form of information that has its place, but what that is, we might want to review. Next, informed by our dark side. Okay, here we go. Informed by our dark side, dissent, madness, nightmares. Can we bear that form of information? Can we be informed by that? It comes at you every night. Broadcasting live and in person at you every night. Your shadow is talking to you every night. That's again the place where I've talked with in the past about remembering our dreams, having the courage to experience the messages from the dark side that are being broadcast every night. That form of information is the most difficult to receive and the most valuable in some ways to understand because it's beyond the reach of your rational mind, of the convictions. The Images that come at us from our dream time, from our dark side, have no interest in our maladaptive normality that we call reality. None. They are bored with that idea. And that's why they're so freaky to the waking maladaptive normality. They're just trying to inform you. Dude, you missed the bus. There's a whole nother ride, and this is what it looks like. Ah! Wake up in a panic and a cold sweat. Okay. That seems to be valuable information. Next, <clears throat> another form of information is vigilant thinking or observing functions confused with a state of awareness. This is the current du jour neurosis. Well, it's tied for the next, in with the next one, but this is good for now. The more I think or worry about something, X, the better information I have approach. <laughs> How's that working for me? <clears throat> it's so freaking convincing. When our daughter was traveling, she got into some 
interesting challenges in a place in China we can't pronounce because we didn't know about it, nor did she. Because of flight complications coming back from Asia, she was transported to by a regional airline with no English-speaking people to a faraway destination, alone at night, by herself, one o'clock in Wuyang, China. No airport closes down, get out, no cash, no English, no credit cards, none of that mattered. Susan and I were faced with this challenge of being 14 hours away by like jet right now <laughs> <clears throat> to an extension of our soul, our daughter. Okay, that's information. She can't call. Thank you, what app? You guys know about what app? It's fantastic. Wherever you travel, it's an app you can put on your iPhone and you can text from anywhere without a price, without a charge. What app? So we're getting the text information of this situation in a place we can't pronounce and don't know where she is. She has no resources. That's information that we'll start to worry about. <coughs> Obviously, that's the right move, right? <laughs> I don't know. How'd it work out for you, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> I know what I was swearing about. <clears throat> so, there's a confusion. The more educated I get, the more I think about things, the more I dwell on things, the more I obsess about things, the more I try to figure things out, usually between 2 and 4 in the morning, the more I think about things, the more I think about things, I'm going to get a better solution to what it is I'm thinking about. Right? <clears throat> that never works. <laughs> it never gives you information that has light. It doesn't inform. <clears throat> One of the biggest puzzles I'm working now in my little brain is what illuminates your dream? What's the light source? When you think about something, you don't need light. To see something, you need light. What illuminates your dream image? What source of light? <clears throat> I don't know. But what I'm saying there is illumination, allowing light to come in as information is very different than trying to think through something and think about it and worry about it. How do we stop that? <clears throat> I'll get to that. That's why they invented whiskey. No. <laughs> <clears throat> but here's the current obsession or the current god of information is data. We're in the information age. We have been for a while. In the Greek and Roman times, the Greek god was Hermes. The Roman god was Mercury, the winged one. They sped information. The faster, the better. Fleet-footed information. Hermes and Mercury <clears throat> are the current gods of information. It's called the Google. used to be called Hermes, used to be called Mercury, now it's called Google. We all believe in Google. It gives us good information. Fine. What are we doing with that information? How's the world doing? <clears throat> but we're smitten by it. <clears throat> 
and we believe that's all the information I need. I just need more information. The last form of information that I'm going to talk about briefly is imagination as a form of information. Applied creativity that takes form, that kind of imagination. Fantasy's cool, dreams are great, but applied, what takes form out of here? There's some wonderful painters and artists in this room and musicians. You can go look at Ed Ender's wonderful information on the walls out here as you leave in the library. His paintings are information. They're informed by light. His imagination won't let him go. That's the passion of the creative mind is the form light takes that illuminates something you've not ever looked at or seen before. You get that exposure every night for three hours. Well, three hours? Why did I say that? I sleep for eight hours. A bunch. A third of your life. That's what I meant, Nick. A third of your life. <laughs> Threes, thirds. Isn't aging a trip? <laughs> Wisdom. May it be so. <clears throat> so, I'm going to submit that imagination is the pathway of information of character. Obsessive thinking is the information of persona. That's the polarity that we're strung out on. Defensive persona, imaginative character, intention all the time, whether it be life, death, love, hate, money, no money, whatever way you say it, there's the path of information that informs repetitively through a closed circuit persona, or there's a path of character that comes through the imagination. Both are not better or worse, but they're both coming at you all the time. So, somebody said the other day, my life is starting to take its full form. And I like that. In form. How am I informed? Okay, to end, before Madeline comes up again and gives us a song, I'm going to read a little prose poem that might have to do with how to maintain good information source. Good information source. <clears throat> okay? Okay. It's called Self-Containment. I have, I have 25 copies and I can ship them to you as well. Because this is what I've come up with as my way of ensuring that I get the best information I can. From the source I don't understand, that source takes the form of this beautiful moment. That source takes the form of my little chickadee in the morning that greets me as I go out to my truck. That form takes the, that information takes the form of a loving embrace. How do we keep that source open? <clears throat> do not be disturbed by lesser forces, nor overwhelmed by greater ones. Have enough personal strength to hold true to the path that reveals itself. Neither act out shadow projections, nor receive dark ones from others. Reveling instead in the interplay of light and dark. See into the heart of the matter through the lens of the intellect grounded by how it feels. Trust intuition to reveal what is right 
while sensing how it registers in the body. Listen carefully for the call of character beyond the din of persona's shame-driven drama. Balance each footfall as it strikes the earth. Look around into the manifest world as if it were a dream with gravity. Then, at day's end, drift into sleep, seeing the images that inform your story. Finally, hold the one you love like there is no tomorrow. Awaken. There you go.